Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the uh, 10 o'clock block on a given Thursday, and we have uh, Talking Tax with Tom. And our subject today is how your state lands are managed. Uh, with Tom is my major contributor here, um, and Keith Chun. Uh, so the first question, uh, Keith, is how did you get into the studio? I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think what we first ought to do is kind of uh, let let folks know who Keith Chun is. Uh, I, I, of course, am uh, Tom Yamachika. I'm the president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, and and I'm the you know usual fixture here in talking tax. Uh, but uh, with us today is uh, Keith Chun. Uh, he used to work at the Department of Land and Natural Resources in the uh, in the Land Division, and he is an attorney like uh, like Jay and I are. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell us, uh, because he's retired, he can tell us from an insider's perspective of what it was like and, and hopefully uh, what we can do about it. So, uh, uh, so Keith, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the uh, DLNR does and what the land division does? Yeah, um, you know, thanks for having me, guys. And, and, and... Tom mentioned I am reaching so I can speak a little more freely. Um, and I did dig this shirt out of my closet of retired clothes for you folks. Um, thank you, thank you. But Keith. you know, the land division manages, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was no small task though. Um, you know, the state manages, up, and I'm doing this by recollection. I was at the land division from 2001 to 2016. So things may have changed, but in, the, the general notion is they manage about 1.3 million acres of public lands. Most of these lands are ceded lands. And um, for those of you, you know, you've heard that term, but it, it, it comes from the Admissions Act in Section 5B. Um, you know, I think one of the very basic starting points is that um, in managing these public lands, these public lands are held in trust. And by virtue of the state constitution, the Admissions Act, and Hawaii revised statute, the state has a fiduciary duty to manage these lands for the benefit of the trust beneficiaries. It can be the general public, the um, Admissions Act goes even more specific. So you manage these ceded lands um, for purposes such as public education, the betterment of conditions of native Hawaiians, housing, public uses, et cetera. So, the general premise is, is that, you know, when you make a decision regarding these lands, you need to reconcile it with how is this in the best interest of the public trust and its beneficiaries. Now, from what I've seen, you know, I can go on with countless examples of mismanagement, but, you know, I think a lot of those have already been detailed in the various star advertiser articles. I think there were three front page articles on it. Um, in 2019, the state auditor's office came out with, you know, for lack of a overused term, a scathing audit of, of um, their management. But it seems that, you know, the, in, in general, the decisions made or recommendations made coming out of land division either show a very poor lack of basic real estate knowledge or the decisions are motivated by something else. And I'll leave that to the speculators, but you know, it, I, I was questioned by people in the business community, the legal community, the real estate com community for decades of, what are you guys doing over there? You know, it, it got to be the point where sometimes you just don't want to admit you work there. <laughs> no. Well, what were you doing when you were working there? So when I was there, I was the planning and development manager. And in that respect, we were tasked with trying to put unutilized or underutilized lands to better use. You know, when I first got there, I think you'll, you'll find for most people, the first question you, you ask is for an inventory of the lands. And, you know, while deal and army claim we have an inventory, what you'll get is a, a Booklet, booklet of lands listed by TMKs, tax map key numbers. But there's really not much else to it. There may be acreage, but you know, some of the things that you use in decision-making is gonna be um, land use commission designation, zoning, 
whether it's in the SMA, those type of things. So you can make decisions on which lands may have income potential, et cetera. That's never really been done. You know, so, so um, it, it begs the question of how does the land division make decisions without an inventory? Um, okay, so, so, so uh, to kind of sum up, you were in the land division, the land division manages our state lands. The, the ones that the state itself has title to right. and um uh and your specific job was to uh find higher and better uses for the uh the lands that were in your inventory right. uh assuming you knew what your inventory was right well yes but here here's the here's the um here's a little twist to it Tom, which led to a lot of the things that that started to come up and which was swept under the table, I believe, is, you know, um, the state owns a lot of lands, but some of the lands are not under land divisions jurisdiction. So for example, they will set aside lands to the Department of Transportation by executive order, or, and you know, the, the transportation department will do with what they want. So, you know, it, I think it's, it's reasonable to say land division is not left with the cream of the crop. Nevertheless, there still are vacant lands that have, I believe, excellent revenue potential. You know, some lands have been subdivided, they're zoned for industrial use, they're, there's infrastructure in place, and yet they've remained vacant for 15 years. And, and it's your division's responsibility to uh, rent those lands out and get income from them yeah. or from them? I believe it is. You know, that's part of our fiduciary duty. Now, on top of that, though, what, what, I, what we discovered is that there's unutilized lands, but they're also underutilized lands. And this is where I, you know, you start to realize that, you know, real estate's cyclical and during a down cycle, you know, some of the stuff might not be in demand or, you know, if, if there's available fee simple land, um, the land division only offers leasehold. You know, so people may favor fee simple. However, what we discovered is lands that were already under lease or under the infamous revocable permit system were generating far less than market rent. So in other words, you know, we could increase the revenues to the state by bringing those to market, you know, while also going after trying to lease out, you know, vacant land. Okay, well, so, so how did you come to that realization? How did, how did you figure out that uh, the, uh, the lands in your portfolio were, were not being rented at market value? Well, you know, you, you really have to, uh, you really have to come up with some kind of comprehensive strategy. And, you know, prior to, to um, going into real estate practice, I, you know, I worked in the financial industry and, and was a credit analyst on the mainland, et cetera. So you look at the financials of the department and what your various sources of revenue are, and track them for the trends or what have you. But you know, you look at certain sources, and and if you just look at the numbers, it may seem okay until you dig deeper. So if, you, for example, if you realize your revocable permits are bringing in X amount of dollars, you might think, hey, that's great. Until you start to delve into it and start to look at specific ones, and that's what we did. That's what we and two others at the land division did. We created our inventory of revocable permits. So you, you were, there, you there was were an not example. satisfied with the way things were being managed. Did you speak yeah. truth to power? Well, yeah. So this is one of the one of the points I wanted to make is we um, we took a, a inventory of the revocable permits. We retained um, a commercial appraiser, independent appraiser with an MIA designation, one of the highest ones, to look and give us an idea where we are. And in our preliminary discussions with them. You know, I would say almost all of them are, are below market, but some of them were, you know, 500 to 1,000 percent below market. Now, this was back in 2012, 2013. We raised this with the administrators. Now, the administrators at Land Division are Russell Suji, Kevin Moore, and to a certain extent, Ian Hirakawa. This was raised with them. At that time, we were told to stop working on it, and they let the appraisal contract lapse. You know. So essentially saying, we don't need this or stop working on it, that was our, was our instructions. Um, it wasn't until 2016 when the Star Advertiser came out with this article on the revocable permits. 
And then that led to the formation of the revocable for, for permit task force. You know, so it's all after the fact. It's not something that that that, that land division, the heads of land division were not aware of. They were aware of. It. No one. We were. We asked why to, we should stop on, and no no reason was given. Now, another interesting part in that was, in the interim, I got reassigned to DLNR's voting division. So I undertook the task of revamping the voting division's revocable permits, which their administrator, Ed Underwood, was fine with. So we did it, we, we appraised it, we implemented interim rent increases until the appraisal was done. We updated, this is a key too, we updated the revocable permit form because, you know, every time you reset things in, in the real estate practice, you try to update your forms. And I told Ed, you know, you, you have permits along waterfront property without adequate insurance, hazardous material provisions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so a lot of this stuff was implemented. Now, land division chose not to follow voting's lead until this star advertiser report came out and now the governor forms a task force and they end up kind of trying to copy what we did at voting. But nobody's ever asked the administrators why back in 2013, this thing wasn't a good enough idea, you know? Okay, and then one of the things that you found uh, in, the, in, the, in the land division was that you had like a certain property that was uh, bringing in, you know, $300,000 in sub rent and you were renting it uh, for $100,000. Yeah, this is, that, this is the whole um, lease extension issue, you know, where, um, the ground leases come up um, after th their term of 55 years or 65 years, and the leases are set to expire. And as the, most people, pretty much everyone in the real estate industry knows that when the lease expires, any improvements revert to the lessor. So my thought on some of these that were going, were being presented to the landlord to, to extend the leases because Statutory, the landlord has the discretion to extend leases if the lessee needs additional time to make improvements to the property. And, and, but that's, an, that's a discretionary right. It's not mandatory. And that's, the, that's what I tried to impress on the land division is you need to look at each lease individually. Some of them, it, it may merit it. But you know, the, land, the landowner, the state, should look at if we have a higher or better use for the property. Is the tenant a good tenant? You know, they're extending leases just because somebody put a new roof on it. And well, are they my, extending my, leases because of political considerations? Yeah. Um, is, is there an insider process happening here? I can only speculate, you know. Um, but here's the, the simple, the simple example I gave to, to, to the administrators was look, for example, in this one case. The building is worth eight hundred thousand dollars. Now I didn't appraise it. That that's been their reply: is the rec the person that recommended is not a licensed appraiser. I go, I understand that, but by even the tax value, tax assessed value is eight hundred thousand. And what you're telling me, Mr. Administrator, is that in three months that building is going to belong to me, and you say you don't want it. So if if you really want to extend that lease, I'm not opposed to it. But the state should be compensated for what I call the reversionary interest in the improvements, what we would have gotten. You know, you can do it multiple ways. You can have the guy pay for it. We can charge him lease rent for the land and improvements, but we don't extend it as a ground lease and just continue to charge them ground lease. Now, in, in, in another example, sure enough, as Tom mentioned, we're, we're collecting ground rent maybe of 80,000, 100,000. Sounds good on paper. But the tenant, I, I don't know if the tenant even occupied the land or maybe occupied one, you know, one office in it, but he sublet the rest of it. And he was making upwards of 300,000 based on, based on what space lease rents were at the time. So what you're telling me is that in three months, that building can be mine and I can step into that shoes and collect the 300,000. Why would we not want to? You know, that one of the answers I got was, well, we don't want to take it back because we, you know, we have a tenant on it. We don't want to risk not having a tenant. I go, they're all, 
They're all sub lessees. They don't care who they write the check to. <laughs> you know, um, no. you know, in in the in the grant releases from Kamehameha schools, uh, there's a formula. And uh, even even 20, 30 years ago, there was a formula. Um, and the formula would be based on, you know, appraisal considerations. Um, uh, do these leases have the formula? Where, where is it breaking down on the on the either the lease or the formula? <coughs> the 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 leases have um, an assignment provision. So if you assign it during the term, you, the state may share it. The the land board has adopted a sublease policy where they would participate, and then that policy was modified several times to acknowledge that. You know, if, if I if I take a ground lease and I build a building and I issue subleases, the state shouldn't participate in that because it's the lessee's money that built the building. And they took the risk that, you know, they may not get tenants, et cetera, et cetera. But when you come to the, the expiration of a lease, that, that's something different. We're talking about, you know, a reversionary interest. That, that's going to be my building. How does that meet? How does that satisfy the best interests of the public trust and the trust beneficiaries? The, the beneficiaries and the trust could be making 300,000 a year and instead is gonna now be saddled with 10 more years of whatever, ground lease rent. You know, and so, I, I, and so what they normally did was they just, they just extended the ground lease in place? Yeah, and, and they, 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 you know, and, and here's the problem is a lot of the replies given are, they sound good, but they're really talking points. You need to dig into substance to it. So the reply you would get, and I saw in the media is that, well, but we, when we extend the lease, we'll get an appraisal. And so it's gonna be market rent. And I go, no, you're, you're appraising the wrong real, real property interest. You know, you're just, you're, you're getting an appraisal for a ground lease rent. But we're essentially giving them back the building. But isn't that a question of what's in the lease? Um, you could write that up in the lease and you can say well, that in so many words and then you get paid, no? There's many ways of addressing it. But the answer really, there wasn't even up for discussion is what I have to say. You know, I had made recommendations on this and, and, and part of it on the staff submittals, I also made the recommendation going back to the basic premise. Maybe we need to start with the basis and explain our fiduciary duty and your recommendation, how it meets the fiduciary duty. Because if you can't answer that question, you better go back to the drawing board. And my sources tell me essentially the staff was said, don't ask for Keith's comments anymore. It does smell uh, political. Um, although, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to actually show that. Yeah. But one, one question that comes to mind is this. <clears throat> one of the trust purposes you mentioned in, in the first few minutes of the show was for the benefit of the Native Hawaiian people. Right. Um, and, um, you know, um, there, it's important that we, you know, uh, take care of them. It's important that we give them a benefit, I think, as a matter of if you dig deep, that's state policy somewhere, somehow, in so many ways, not necessarily articulated. So at some point, um, it could be that DLNR was uh, leasing these premises to people um, it felt uh, were worthy recipients of a discount. Uh, namely Native Hawaiians, uh, for Native Hawaiian businesses, what have you, agriculture, what have you. Um, and, and as a result, it, it sort of got baked in uh, that, that, that these leases, because it was state land, because there were a certain number of Native Hawaiians involved, would be below market. Is there, is there any, that's, that's a wild guess I make, but I no, wonder if I, there's I any don't truth think there's to any that. to that, Jake. In other words, like I said, you know, the basic question you need to ask yourself is how is this in the best interest of the trust? How does it fulfill my fiduciary duty? If that in fact was true, then 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 the recommendation should say that. You know, we're 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 fulfilling our duty because Native Hawaiians are one of the trust beneficiaries and the tenant is a Native Hawaiian and therefore blah 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 blah. That's never been articulated. It, the, the rationale has always been the lessee needs it because they're putting in improvements. And the legislature determined that if you put in improvements, you can get an extension. To me, again, that, that's a discretionary thing, you know, but it, it, could be, it could have been articulated as the reason. It never has. Been. Let me give you an, an oblique thought on this, Keith, and that is that, you know, in an island state, we only have a limited amount of land. Right. And, and the, the limitation affects everything and everybody. 
Um, as a result, too many people pay too much for the cost of occupancy. The appraisal community is largely owned by the owners. Uh, and so, you know, the prices go up and up and up and up and up. <laughs> and, and, and of course, um, you know, this, this has an effect on everything. Uh, and the state never really, mm, you know, um, it, it's, it's never generous in terms of giving state land for a valid state purpose. For, for example, um, if I'm in, a, in an industry that should be preferred, say technology um, for diversification, um, and I want to, and I want to lease some land for some state facility, some technology facility somewhere. Um, uh, the the state is really not in the market, I don't think, uh, to provide me with a lease that can help me somehow achieve this uh, diversification. Or is it? I'm guessing, but I've always I've always heard and felt that the state could do more uh, for um, you know uh, to. to to incentivize uh, sectors and businesses that should be incentivized. What do you think? Well, I mean, well, let okay. me let me kind of start off on on that, and and, and that is um, that you, when you're talking about policy decisions like that, those those really come from the legislature, and and the legislature has uh, you know formed bodies like High Technology mm -hmm. Development Corporation, for example, uh, to deal with that kind of thing. I mean, it, it it's it's not necessarily land divisions kuleana uh to to go in and and deal with those kind of policy imperatives uh and, and unless there's you know some law that says you got you know, they got to do it right i mean uh keith uh, what do you think well again I, this this is my opinion and you know if i may slide off the subject just for a bit this goes back to one of the the findings or recommendations in the audit, which that is that land division lacks a strategic plan, you know, and um, this is, again, one of those things that you need to ask why, because this audit came out in 2019. In 2015, I had prepared an asset management strategy and I had prepared it. Um, um, for the for the state along with an asset portfolio, which was a booklet of DLNR's leasing practices and examples of um, properties we had available to either be leased or to, to use property management services. So, you know, it was pretty, quite a bit of work went into it. And there was a preliminary analysis of, of my findings and I was instructed by DLNR's administrators that we do not need this, stop working on it. Again, no, no reason or rationale, but now along comes the 2019 audit pointing it out. And now they're scrambling to put together an asset management plan. And my understanding is they recently took it to the board to give an update. And it, it, when I looked at it, 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 was, it, it was a piecemeal thing. And it almost showed that you don't have a comprehensive asset management plan. And I believe Mr. Hirokawa, who presented it, says we're going to hire a consultant to do a help us. And he wanted to hire an economist. I, 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 I find that kind of ludicrous. But again, it goes back to the issue of why were, were, were we instructed to stop working on this back in 2015? I told Tom before, with this asset portfolio, it could be used to present in, in presentations to the land board, to the legislature, and more importantly, to real estate brokers who help us market the property. And I, in fact, began setting up meetings with brokerage firms. The president of Collier's agreed to meet with me. And, and, and you'll hear some excuses like we couldn't hire brokers because of the procurement code. And I disagree with that. I've looked at the code and there's various ways we could. And, and, and Collier's, um, she was willing to say, we'll figure something, let's just come in and talk. So then I got the instructions to stop working on it with no explanation. Because mind you, um, land division's marketing policy is to put a, a notice in the paper saying land is available for auction and pound a four lease sign sale on the property. That's it. Then you sit at the phone and wait for it to ring. You know, what other landowner do you know markets their own property? You know, so when, when I was told to stop working on this, I asked if what we're, is, are we just going to use the, the, our standard pound the four lease sign 
on the property uh, marketing planning, Kevin Moore said, yes, that's what we're going to do. Um, now, okay, so that's, uh, I think, that then the, uh, uh, the, the most recent development on this uh, score is that there's inve an investigative committee that has been formed by the State House. So yeah. um, why, don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about that and, and what, well, what they're doing? No, uh, sorry, Tom. The reason I diverted was that I was going to answer Jay's question prior to, you know, using okay, State go ahead. And that comes along with this comprehensive asset management strategy. You know, you have certain lands, but what you what as a trust, I believe most major trusts do is they set aside and identify certain lands solely for income producing purposes. For example, KSB does not use every land it owns for school. So if we designate certain assets to be income producing, then we definitely should be seeking fair market rent for that and not discounted rent because the sole purpose of those lands is to generate income. However, aside from those lands, if there are other lands that could suit other uses, and, and, and Jay mentioned high tech, but another purpose would be ag. And again, those are policies set out by the legislature. But as a fiduciary, you could easily go to the land board and say, I wanna lease this land to the, this high tech um, company or to this ag, and we're, we're, we're willing to take below market because it's consistent with the legislative policy of promoting agriculture, promoting high tech. I think that's, then, then you have some valid justification that it still falls within their fiduciary duty. You know, DLNR has come, across, come back to the audit and saying, we can't manage our lands like a private entity because we, we're not here to maximize every dollar of every piece of land. And that's true. But when you designate certain parcels to be income producing, you shouldn't be discounting those rents. So that, that, that's how I think you could address the needs that, that, that Jay had mentioned about other um, you know, public interest type of, of uses. Does that necessarily require legislative action uh, or could that be done in-house as a matter of the plan? I think it could be done in-house. You know, again, like if you designate lands for income, then make income. But other lands, if, if, if your high tech company wants to lease it and it's not there, you know, designated for income producing, we can definitely say it's consistent with the state's policy of promoting high tech. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the land board's decision, but, but I would certainly be able to make that pitch and, and, and feel comfortable that I am fulfilling my fiduciary duty. I don't have to get every top dollar for every parcel of land. Tom, you were asking about an investigative committee? Yep. So, uh, so, so Keith, why don't you tell us about that? Well, you know, I, I found out this, you know, some people that still keep in touch with me have told me that um, in response to the audit, the legislature formed an investigative committee to look into two audits. One is of ABC, the Agriculture Development Corp, and, and the other is the deal on our special land fund. So my understanding is the, the committee has met once or twice already and is going to be looking into this. Now, uh, whether it's a political thing to look good versus whether they're serious, I, I, I can't speak. I believe they're supposed to come up with um, a list of witnesses that they want to call. You know, my suggestion would be that they call former land division employees that can shed light on what they've seen. Um, also, that they, that can be used to rebut any for <laughs> excuses made by land division. You know, um, I should I, I should let Jay know that after making all of these recommendations, um, Land Division decided to let me go. So I lost my job in 2016, um, and I was on an annual contract. So it was it was it had been renewed 15 years in a row. There are 12 type of 12 employees or so in Land Division that are under this annual contract thing, and all of them have always had their contracts renewed. But the explanation given to me was your job is temporary in nature, so we're not going to renew it. But, but I think what, what the effect it had throughout land division was you better learn from this because if you want to try and oppose the administrators, your contract won't be renewed. You know. So you were made an example, basically. Yeah, I believe so. You know, because before speaking up, I, from the same administrators, 
I had always received excellent employee reviews. And then I, I stopped getting annual reviews. And, you know, I, I don't think it's a far reach to figure out what happened. But was this just a policy disagreement or is there something under the hood here? Well, you know, it would be nice if, if they ever sat down and explained the, the rationale for their decision, but there, there just wasn't. So, you know, silence speaks pretty loudly. Yes, it does. <laughs> so what, what would you like to see the investigative committee find and do and recommend to the legislature? You know, I think, I, I don't think you're gonna see any significant improvement unless you, you change the administrators. These guys have been there forever. They've ignored recommendations. Um, they're not gonna get, if, if it's because of, of lack of acumen, at this point, you're not gonna get any smarter. You know, you're not going to be able to squeeze blood out of a stone. If it's something else, that's even more reason to. But, you know, um, every action they seem to have been taken is only in reaction to being publicly embarrassed. You know, I'm going to deal with RPs because it, it splashed the front page of the Star Advertiser. I'm going to come up with an asset management plan because the, the audit said I need to. But nobody can, as and the reason I, 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 I appreciate being invited is that nobody knows the background of what you were made aware of this years before it happened and you just silenced it. Why? So, so Keith, you know, um, suppose I am uh, Joe Blow walking down the street. I know nothing about state lands, okay? Then you can run that land division. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question to you is why should Joe Blow care about this? Well, number one is Joe Blow is a definite beneficiary of the public land trust. It's, it's, it speaks to that in, I believe, the state constitution. Number two is if, for example, on your, your industrial lease, you're, we're collecting 100,000, but we should be collecting 300,000. Mr. Taxpayer is subsidizing that lessee to the tune of 200,000. It's no different than charging that lessee fair market rent and the state handing them a check for 200,000. We wouldn't have to increase our taxes or cut back our services if we were really managing these lands properly. Same thing, I, I, again, I, I tried to put it in as simple as possible for people to, in the, the department to understand is if you have an apartment building that's owned by your family trust and your friend wants to rent two units for a dollar a piece, well, that's great for the tenant. But don't you think Uncle Auntie and your cousins are going to be pissed off? <laughs> yeah, and so the so the the simple answer is yeah, uh, Mr. Joe Blow on the street, uh, you're one of the owners of this land, and yeah. and and you're getting screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, these ceded lands. You know, again, some of the specified purposes in the Admissions Act is public education betterment of native Hawaiian tradition. You know, these, the legislature scrambling for money. You know, now I will bring this one other point up that, that, that for you to chew on. Um, several years ago, Russell Suji went to the land board and asked for authority to be granted to him to transfer revenues from ceded lands, from any ceded lands into the special land fund. So, what would normally go to the general fund, if he chooses to on his own, he doesn't need to go back to the land board even. He could take the lease rents from the leases of those ceded lands and put it into deal in our special land fund. Now, that has been done to the tune of several million a year. But the troubling part is theoretically under that broad delegation of authority, he could transfer every single penny of ceded land revenues to the special land fund, after which it could only be used for the purposes in the statute, which are which don't really reconcile with the admissions. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you know that kind of power shouldn't even be granted to the DLNR chairperson, let alone a, a civil servant administrator. Yeah. Tom, can you put this in a larger perspective and summarize um, you know what it means? Uh, to the state economy, what it means to um, state policy and priorities in general? Well, I mean, uh, 
let's let's kind of put it this way. Uh, you have uh, this agency uh, that's supposed to be safeguarding our assets, and these are our assets because as taxpayers of the state of Hawaii, we own them. Uh, they have a duty to make sure that, that those uh, lands are being used properly. Uh, some of them are, some of them are not. Uh, there are demonstrable examples of how some of these lands are either uh, underutilized or uh, or they bring in fair, you know, uh, much less than fair market rent when we should be getting fair market rent of bringing in uh, percentage revenue when, when the department has no way to even check the percentage or even has any institutional system for uh, making sure that, 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 that we the people aren't getting scammed out of this. And, and, and like Keith said, uh, to the extent that we're not making uh, you know, our proper return from this, uh, from this land portfolio and, you know, government's there and is costing money, uh, guess who has to pick up the difference? You know, you, you, me, and Joe, Joe Blow taxpayer. Uh, that's, that's why we should all be concerned. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the legislative select committee, uh, that's, that's looking into this, uh, is, is going to come down and, and come down hard and, uh, and require that uh, positive changes be made. So, uh, and, and those will be, you know, for everybody's benefit. Well, thank you, Keith, for yeah, discussing you. and, uh, you know, giving us your, your, your candor on this. Um, I, I, I hope uh, we all follow. I, I suspect you will follow the work of this, this committee. And I hope we can get together again and take a look at that work and those recommendations, uh, you know when they when they come out. Um, okay. I really appreciate your um, your sense of uh, community about this, and uh, good for you. You're you're a, a, a true. Okay. You're, hey you're Jay, a, one last thing. If you run across that guy walking on the street with no sense of real estate knowledge yeah. or anything, yeah, make sure he applies if this land division administrator job comes open, huh? Is that, is that a way of, of helping him, helping us, or punishing him? <laughs> I want you to know that I know other people who have been with DLNR. <laughs> well, thank you, Keith Chun and uh, Tom Yamachik. It's great to talk to you about this. Thanks for having me. And we look forward to our next conversation about it. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Oh, aloha. Okay.